You are listening to 95.7 FM, WELT, Fort Wayne, Radioactive. The opinions and views expressed in this show are that of the hosts and guests only. They do not represent those of Free Thought Fort Wayne, Secular Fort Wayne, WELT, or any other organization. How can I live in society if I don't believe in God? How can I understand the world around me without religion? What can I do to make the world a better place? Where did we come from? How can I be a moral person? These are just some of the profound questions we as humans have pondered for millennia. Join us as we ponder these questions free from the ideologies of religion and superstition. Welcome to the Hoosier Humanist Hour, where we explore science, religion, culture, ethics, and community from the humanist perspective. I'm your host, Andrew, and this is episode 7 of the Hoosier Humanist Hour. This episode is a conversation between D, Chris, V, and myself. Okay, so this uh, this event that happened in Brussels has been another terrible act in Europe, and there's all kinds of news, and by the time our audience hears this, most people are probably going to be tired of hearing about it, possibly, but I just really want, I would be interested in talking with you guys about what you guys know about what's going on and like why this is happening over there. Um, also the immigration that's going on in Europe, why what's going on in the countries where these people are coming from and why is there such terrible conditions that would cause people to immigrate. And I, uh, I don't know a whole lot. I just know that it's uh, from what I've heard and read that it's terror and well, it's induced by religion, religious fanatics. Um, it's, um, a, I guess, a sect of Islam is what you would call it, and uh, it's extreme. And their desire is to basically destroy Western culture. Is that right? It, and that's what we're seeing over there. What is their goals over there in Europe? Does anybody know? Um, well, from what I understand, you know, ISIS took responsibility for this attack. Um, so it's definitely, or, you know, it seems like it's related to, you know, the whole radical, crazy Islamists, uh, you know, that basically want to impose their way of life on the rest of the world. And they're ready to do that by any means necessary. Um, I mean, it ties very well with what you were saying of, you know, the all the people that are migrating. I mean, they're, even though a lot of the people that are migrating right now around Europe are Muslim, they don't subscribe to that, you know, extreme radical view and they want to get out of there. Do they know what kind of percentage of people who are coming in are of this radical subset? Like, is one out of a thousand, or do we have any clue? <laughs> uh, I mean, of the people that are fleeing, I doubt that there's many that subscribe to that ideology. I mean, if they did, they'd stay. Oh, good My thinking about it, unless, you know, you subscribe kind of to the view that, um, you know, they're, they're hiding in, in between all the normal... Uh, people that are just fleeing the violence and they just want to infiltrate the West to be able to do precisely what happened, that, uh, you know, in Brussels. Hmm. So what's going on in their home countries, Syria, Libya, some other Middle East, Middle Eastern countries, I'm not entirely sure, is that is is, I mean, it, is it an extreme version of Islam attacking these people too? Is that why they're running to Europe? Like, what's driving people to Europe? I'm not real clear on that. Time, long time. Uh, Germany had kind of an open borders policy where if you get yourself to Germany, you will be granted refugee status. Um, and I mean, Germany is a pretty nice place to live. So a lot of people, you know, that's that that was their end goal is because they knew 
if they can get there, uh, you know, they'll be granted refugee status, they won't be deported, and they'll get to stay. But actually, in some countries right now, uh, some of those refugees are being deported back to where they came from if, you know, if it's determined that they're not just fleeing violence, but they're fleeing, you know, they're more economic type of refugees. Hmm. So it's it, it's a lot. I mean, there's there's millions of people migrating. You know, there's a lot in Jordan and Turkey. You know, they're flowing through Greece and Bulgaria and Serbia and you know all those Southeast European countries through Italy. Um, you know, they're just pushing their way north into Germany and France and you know wherever they could get to. Hmm. A lot of the locals are getting pretty upset at those kind of inflows because that puts a big strain on their own government and their economies right now aren't doing so hot. Yeah. That all makes sense, I guess. But So in Syria, you have Assad, who is the recognized ruler of Syria. But there's a civil war going on there. And uh, do we know what or does anybody know what the civil war is? Like, what it's about? Like, is it religious in nature? In a way. I mean, ISIS is the big threat there. So it suddenly has that crazy religious component to it. So, that's interesting. I just would think that over time, if you keep having these attacks, and they could be slow or fast, but over a long enough period of time, it just builds a lot of resentment amongst the people from the West toward at least a sect of the Islamic religion. And doesn't eventually you have enough people, it seems like, who are against the Islamic religion that you really start a uh, real cultural divide more than it already exists between those two religions. And it, I don't see it abating at all. Instead of like the world's religions, Islam and Christianity coming together as as a world community, it seems like we're starting to divide more. And it's, that seems like if that's their goal, like that could cause a lot of problems. <laughs> that's exactly and, their goal. That's exactly their goal. ISIS's goal, because if they can, uh, you know, create this kind of mistrust between Christianity and um, in Islam, you know, Christianity being the predominant religion of the West, um, I don't think they care so much about Buddhists and Hinduists in the East, although, you know, when you consider China and India, how big they are, they're certainly comparable in numbers to Christians. Um, But, you know, by creating that mistrust, they can attract more people to join their cause and that's how they grow and that's how they advance that's that's scary kind of things are precisely playing in their hand it's very scary stuff and it just begs begs the question about religion the people who are doing this atrocious stuff taking life um innocent life at least in the cause that they're fighting for um, believe what they're doing wholeheartedly, and then the people who are against them, the West, Christianity, or a lot of Islam too, they also believe that they are right and that this group of terrorists is wrong, and everybody's completely convinced, but nobody ever asked the question of, like, maybe we're all wrong. It, when you add in the underlying facets of faith which is belief without evidence it just really complicates an issue like this because how how can you approach it with reason when you've thrown out reason and some on one of the key issues of the problem and i just it boggles my mind like how we're going to solve this issue when we approach it from a religious perspective I mean, yeah, certainly religion helps there, um, or hurts rather, I don't know how you want to phrase it, but, um, it's, it's certainly more difficult to get a non-believer to put on a suicide vest. 
You know, I, I sure. You know, you you can certainly be passionate about a cause as an unbeliever and want to tackle it. And you want may want to fight for it, but you would want a reasonable chance of walking out of there without too many holes in your body. Um, you know, right. without sustaining injuries incompatible with life. <laughs> well, if you were going to get 70 virgins when you died, I guess that might uh, change the way you think about that. <laughs> Powerful motivator. Jeez. It's scary. Do you have any opinion on this stuff, Christopher? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I guess my problem is that when it comes to situations like this and, and talking about refugees... I would never and could never be a refugee um, because I, I I have this stubbornness uh, in my bones that says that if something is messed up and going on in my community, I'm going to take up arms and neutralize the threat or at least fight against it as much as possible. So it's it's difficult for me to see the human race be so prone to moving away from a threat as opposed to standing and fighting against a threat. Um, I would like to see a lot more local involvement in fighting these threats. Because honestly, I think that if terrorism is, you know, uh, particularly prevent in, prevalent in this town, then you should have a number of people in that town creating a, an insurgent, rebellious group against this terrorist group, group. And so to some degree, I would think and expect humans to develop some level of community to where you have some sort of balance developing, where you have, oh yeah, this insurgent or terroristic threat, but you also have the local populace gathering together to fight against uh, and combat that threat. Hmm. Apparently my view of humanity is a little op optimistic sometimes. Well, we have the, you know, the army and the police. I think that's our answer to that, but they don't really aren't capable of really addressing this kind of particular threat where the the group is isolated and tiny and totally under the radar. Like, I don't, I don't know. It would require a lot of intrusion, it seems like, into regular people's lives to really get control of it. I, I think part of it really honestly comes down to the willingness of the populace to participate in this process. You know, mm. too many people are, are, are too apt to just say, oh, well, you know, I, I see uh, somebody with an AK-47 across my street. Um, I'm not going to report that because clearly they're not bothering me right now, so I'm just going to let it go. Uh, and I see that as a problem because people don't think about the future. Later on down the line, guess what? That one person that you saw, that, that one person down the street could have been the mastermind behind this whole thing. So why, why can't we uh, have them report to authorities with some sort of reward system in place to where, you know, their, their, their courage and their bravery is encouraged or rewarded. Um, I, I would like to see that. I would love yeah. to see that kind of uh, participation by the public in these types of things. They would start calling that idea, at least in this area of the country, is, is like you'd be the Stasi or... Uh, the secret police or Russia had all kinds of informants all over the place. Right. But here in the U S we have crime stoppers, right? So yeah. you anonymously report that you've seen yeah. this known criminal and you get a reward for it. Yeah. They, they, they should have systems like that in place. That makes sense. I hope we don't have to have like a terrorist hotline that we have to tell. Our, yeah, everybody exactly. about. That would stink. <laughs> <laughs> that means we'd be really losing the battle if we had that. But <laughs> So okay. one interesting – I'm going to jump in here for a second. Yes, go. Um, go, go. One interesting thing that, that I heard from uh, a certain someone that has a PhD in religious studies and has studied the region uh, for a long time is that um, the, the ISIS group, in particular, at the top, the people aren't that religious, but they're twisting the religion to get followers and to, you know, to be able to establish their political goals 
um, and you know they're just they're just using the religion as a tool to achieve their you know their own personal megalomaniacal goals basically now You're hold saying, on hold on is that, that aslan yeah no no like, no come on. totally no. totally different person i <laughs> hey i'm not saying okay. that i buy the argument that's that's what some people would argue but the religion itself a, it, does say these things like the quran yes. says these things it says kill all non-believers and heretics. As oh. does the Bible. Exactly. Actually, funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> but Aren't they the same sh- book up until about halfway through? Hmm. <laughs> and, side note. Um, yeah. Well, well, to just give you an example um, of exactly what Andrew was just saying, um, you know, my people were enslaved by the Ottoman Empire for hundreds of years. And there were specific words that were used for non-believers that kind of made you as something less than human, basically. Mm. And there were forced conversions of the, you know, of the Christian population. Um, You know, there were there are certain movies that are actually fairly good representations of what was happening where they would. Uh, you know, the army would basically come roll into a village and they'd gather everyone in the, you know, village square or just outside on some, you know, lawn or something. And, you know, if you didn't accept Islam, you were just killed right on the spot, sometimes tortured while, while killing you. Um, and, you know, they would... Sometimes they'd force the parents to watch the kids uh, being killed, and um, there was this happened. This happened in your home country. Well, it happened. Uh, you know, we freed ourselves from the Ottoman Empire in like 1878, and the Ottoman Empire was a primarily Islamic regime. It's it's modern day Turkey. It's modern okay. day, Turkey. Uh, and, uh, and that was only 125 years ago. That yeah yeah oh my goodness it wasn't that long ago um, they had also something that we called the blood tax where they would quite literally take your firstborn male child into the Turkish army I mean I don't know if it was always the firstborn but they would roll into a given area and basically kids that were you know boys like four four five six seven years old where they, you know, could easily be brainwashed and they would forget their, uh, you know, who they are and where they're from, would be trained to be some of their most most fierce soldiers. And oftentimes, if there was a rebellion in a certain part of the country, you know, if they had some of those uh, soldiers from that area, they would send them there hmm. um, deliberately. And there was there was a big movie where, you know, uh, the the brother you know is is you know there's there's two brothers and one of them is taken as one of those soldiers and then he's sent back to convert his uh, home village and he encounters you know the two brothers encounter each other and um, you know it, it, that those kind of things were not you know impossible to happen and i mean it was brutal it was brutal and you know they they when as the ottoman empire was first spreading throughout you know southeast europe you know they called it a jihad you know a holy war they were fighting against the unbelievers and all that so this has been going on for hundreds of years yeah well there's an interesting uh paradigm so to speak in that maneuver and it's basically a standard conqueror protocol to go into a place kill all the adult males rape all the women and then conscript all of the children into the military Mm -hmm. sure so that that's that's really a pretty standard maneuver and we as far as describing what you're talking about as far as 
referring to the religion and making sure that people accepted that religion, well, that happened pretty much right here at home. Uh, not only with the Native Americans, but definitely with the South Americans when they were presented with the threat of Christianity. Uh, either you adopt Christianity or you die. That was a given choice to them. And so, lo wow. and behold, a number of the population willingly converted to Christianity to survive. Wow. Man, that's one of the things you don't think about. <laughs> yeah, right. Very much. But you have heard, I've heard that before, too. Wow, that's really scary. So, Christ, Christians many times would say that, uh, or at least when I was a Christian, um, I would have thought that uh, our morality was higher than the Islamic morality. And uh, I guess history has shown that to be not true, but it's it may be different now, though. Would, would you guys say that Christian morality is better than Islamic morality in, as a whole? Like, it does, is it just the fact that people are taking parts of the Quran that are particularly brutal and vaulting them up over there, but we still have those types of things in the Bible as well, the Christian Bible, but those aren't held up as values people seem to want to crusade for, thank goodness. Also, but uh, what, what, yeah. to go along with that, uh, the difference, the, the, one of the main differences I see between Christianity and, and Islam is the fact that the way it's taught. Because in Christianity, for the most part, it's just kind of loosely there and interpreted through preachers and everything like that. With Islam, it's you're forced. You're you're basically uh, forced to memorize the entire Quran, cover to cover, over and over again. Hmm. And you pray what, five times a day, isn't it? You're supposed to. Yeah, you, you pray five times a day. That keeps it in your mind every day, all day. Hmm. And yeah, it that right there is kind of indoctrination. It, it not kind of it is indoctrination. And that's the way I that's that's the probably why it's I'm not trying to I can't can't think of what I'm trying to say now. Yeah. Andrew, what I get what I get the point that you're trying to make. What would you say the difference is between indoctrination and brainwashing? Is there a difference between the two? Uh overall, no. It's just I I think the time span would be different. But the the results about the same. Yeah, they seem to be the same. But I I haven't really studied the topic, but indoctrination seems like brainwashing to me it's basically brainwashing uh, over an entire over a long period of time that that's the way i look at it anyway Jeez, and that's that's actually an, a very good point to bring up just because i being an educator i like to bring up the difference between indoctrination or brainwashing and education hmm. those are two different things entirely and sometimes people forget that the methods behind indoctrina indoctrination and brainwashing are basically talking about inserting certain ideas into people's heads that may not necessarily be based on facts, which is why you have education, which tends to be based on facts. Um, whereas indoctrination, you're just kind of trying to teach people to think a certain way regardless of whatever the facts may be. Uh, and to in, in insert certain biases into mm -hmm. their mode of thinking. Uh, the, uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is, is how, when it comes to this whole nature of, um, you know, sitting here and looking at uh, Islam versus Christianity, we're having two different points in the evolution of each religion, so to speak. So Christianity has come so far... Uh, as to start reaching the point where, oh, they can start being more loose in their teachings because they've already dominated a significant part of the globe uh, as far as religion. Whereas Islam is still kind of on its way up, uh, trying to climb the rungs of the ladder to become a dominant religion on this planet. 
And in so doing, while you're in the early stages of evolution of that religion, you have to be very, very strict. You have to very strictly indoctrinate. You have to get people to think a certain way. You have to get people to die for that religion. So they're basically at the level of the Crusades that Christianity was several hundred years ago. And that's why Christianity gets to play the, the higher card in being the less violent religion right now because they've already gone through their violent stage. All right. Mm. They're now calming down. Uh, and so they get to sit back and be like, oh, well, what's wrong with you Islamic guys? Because right. now you're being all violent and stuff. And we've never been that way, clearly. So uh, we get to sit back and make fun of you for being violent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very true. I mean, you know, Christianity has had Reformation movements. You know, there's been the whole Enlightenment period. Um, you know, the the secular world and secular philosophies and science has been pulling the the Western world and Christianity along with it, kicking and screaming for hundreds of years now. Um, and you know, we're we're to a point where. Um, you know the the people of uh, of the Western world. It's just impossible to get them to go on a you know some holy war or something like that. You know there may be some some pockets, there may be some some small groups here and there, but there you know it is in the overall society, it's impossible for them to make any kind of significant gains or any kind of. Uh, you know, movement that's that's in any way significant. Um, so, yeah, the 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 you know, you're you're right, Christopher. That Christianity has had more time. You know, they're they're they've gone through processes that have made them milder, and yeah, that's interesting. I, uh, I'm really curious about this indoctrination topic. <laughs> I hope I'm not digressing back to it um, against anybody's will. But as a parent, I'm really interested in this idea because I'm really trying not to indoctrinate my daughters at all. But as far as like religion is concerned or any kind of superstition, but I am indoctrinating them with what I would say is the golden rule treat others the way that you want to be treated. Like I try to indoctrinate my children with that idea and that is it. Like there is no other indoctrination that I do with them as much as possible. Maybe there's a couple blind spots, but um, I can't really justify indoctrination in any way. And I even wonder if doing it on, with that is wrong, but isn't, is indoctrination ever an acceptable practice for anything? Well, there's a difference between indoctrinating and teaching and, you know, sure. raising kids with good morals and stuff like that. So, um, but, I mean, in a sense, it's a, it's a difference in degree and scale. Um, you know, if, if you're raising free thinkers and... You teach them to think for themselves, to, you know, make up their own mind, to investigate how the world works and, you know, all these all these things that, that we believe in as uh, humanists and free thinkers. Um, I, I don't know if, if that necessarily qualifies as indoctrination. Um, I mean, how can you... You know, is it indoctrination if you're trying to teach someone to think for themselves? You know, indoctrination to me would be, it has to have an element of, you know, of dogma, of here is a set of rules that, yes. that we have, or here's a set of beliefs or, or whatever that we have, and you must follow these or else, you know. To me, that's indoctrination, where if you're thinking, if you're if you're teaching someone to, to think for themselves, to to do all these other, you know, things that we do as free thinkers. I, I just don't know if you can really make the argument that that's indoctrination. I think that's a really good point. Like, I just, I 
indoctrination to me is believing something without evidence, really, more or less, and trying to get somebody to do the same thing uh, for reasons outside of evidence, like be a part of the group or everybody does it or um, all the arguments for, also, for faith. You know, it, when, when it's indoctrination, it's not subject to change. True. But some indoctrination could be good. Some indoctrination could be good, even though there may not be evidence necessarily for it. So, oh, sure. but it, would that indoctrination be good as well? Like, is it okay to, like, allow people to be naive on certain topics instead of actually understanding why? Mm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Well, the question comes back, I think, to the original topic that I had on this for this show is: Is religion good at all? Like, there's a lot of good arguments for the idea that religion has caused a lot of good, that it has helped a lot of people for a lot of various reasons, and it also has done a lot of bad as well. But is it ideal? Like, is it okay logically to think, like, well, it's just okay if people want to be ignorant about things? Not that you can change them necessarily. I'm not advocating, like, saying that they can't be that way. But it just doesn't seem like an acceptable way to live your life in society to me. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll share two of my favorite quotes on this manner. Um, uh, I think it was uh, maybe it was Weinberg that that said this one. Um, you know, good people will do good things, bad people will do bad things. The only way to make a good person do something bad is religion. Um, and now I can't think of the second quote that I was going to have, but <laughs> you know, that's that's certainly there. Um, you know, religion certainly affects the way we behave. And oh, uh, the other one was actually, I think, a, a challenge from Christopher Hitchens. You know, name me a moral action or a statement that can be done only or made only by a person of faith and not by someone that lacks religion. You know, that there's there's nothing that you know, a religious person can do that's good that a secular person couldn't do or say. But right. the opposite is very easy. You know, it wouldn't take five minutes for any one of us or the listeners to come up with the reverse where, you know, name me a, an immoral action that can only be performed by a religious person, you know. Right. Um, so... Yeah, certainly religion has, you know, maybe pushed some people to be good and to do better. But I don't know. I, I, I give people more credit than to think that, um, you know, if you weren't forced into it and strong armed into it by religion, that you would all of a sudden become this giant, uh, you know, you know, I don't think you'd become uh, a bad person overnight if you lost your faith that you would stop donating to the cancer society if that's what you were doing previously. Or that, you know, you would stop volunteering with for the homeless or underprivileged kids, you know, or some, whatever you were doing on a regular basis. I give you more credit than to think that you know, every morning you wake up and you're like, oh, if I don't do this, you know, the uh, my God will punish me. You know, it says that I should do this in the book. Therefore, I must, you know, wake up at 6 a.m. and go and do it. I, I don't think that anybody really thinks in that way. Or if you do, that'd be very sad. I did. Not, really? Not in extreme ways. Yeah, not in extreme ways, but I did. You know, one of the one of the people who really changed my life, one of the authors that changed my life, and I, knowing you guys, you some of you guys at least, I think you'll get a kick out of it, is Ayn Rand. Oh wow, I know. Um, she in her 
ideas basically convinced me that that kind of ideology, like sacrificing just because somebody, something says you should do it, but there's no return, like the idea of sacrifice for nothing, mm -hmm. like was really a powerful idea that I entertained for quite a while and really was a big step of, for me out of religion because I felt like I had been doing that. I had just been doing all this stuff with for no return just because I was told was she religious? No, no, she was an atheist. No. Okay. I think a lot of her ideas are extreme in a lot of ways, but oh sure, uh, your, what you were talking about, I can definitely relate to. Yeah, I was just, I was just curious, uh, you know, how religious uh, she was or wasn't. Yeah, she was a staunch atheist, I believe. Um, when we have when we have all this stuff going on in Europe, you know, <laughs> the pushback against it is not toward Islam; it's toward extreme extremism, extremists. Yeah. But yeah. to me, that does that seems like you're just plucking out a little root of the problem. To me, the problem is religion. <laughs> I, I I think I think going back to one of your earlier concerns as far as indoctrination. I think really how we gauge indoctrination is how many walls and how big those walls are as far as the walls that we put into other people's brains, right? So mm. when we're talking about em trying to embrace science and technology and facts, we're talking about putting up one wall, and that one wall is the scientific method, and that's it. Mm. Beyond that, you have religions that say, oh, well, there's this wall to where uh, there's a god. There's this wall to say that there are miracles. There's this wall to say that your religion is the right one. There's this wall to say that everyone else is an enemy or needs to be saved. There's this wall to say, oh, you get 72 virgins upon death. There's this other wall that says, oh, gays are evil. They will die, so you need to try to convert them to being straight and to being your religion uh, in order to save them. I see all these walls coming up and being kind of one of the metrics that we can use to gauge uh, the, the level of indoctrination, so to speak, that you're doing in some of these religions or in these belief systems to kind of put in that bias to shrink your audience as much as possible and basically vilify the entirety of the rest of the world. Hmm. I know growing yeah, up sorry do, go for it they, oh, I was going to say religions certainly do that they vilify the rest of the world and, and they make it tough to leave you know in mm -hmm. uh, you know places where you know you have more uh, hardcore you know and again I'll use Islam um, you know where they practice uh you know, more strict Sharia and and all these things. I mean, you're risking your life if you want to leave the religion. Hmm. And I, I just to go... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I, I was just going to say, uh, uh, just to go back along your line of quoting people, uh, there's actually this man that, that I've gotten to meet uh, in person. I actually gave E.O. Wilson uh, a tour around the snake facility while I was getting my master's out in Colorado. And uh, he actually has this nice little quote here about religious faith is dragging us down. Uh, the extinctions we cause will kill us too, but the best thing would be to eliminate religions, though not human spiritual yearning. <laughs> so famous like uh, ant biologist is basically saying it would be great to get rid of religion, but maintain some level of spirituality, which is an entirely different subject uh, altogether. <laughs> yeah, but but even he realizes that, that religion can kind of get in the way. And, and I think that's kind of what we're trying to get into here as far as religion putting up walls and defining people in a way that creates more enemies than it does friends. Hmm. I think that's a problem. Oh, of course, yeah. There, there, I mean, it certainly creates one big wall of us versus them you know they're the others the different ones and you know uh of of any religion and there's hundreds of religions you know around the world 
some practice in small groups, some in large, but, um, you know, there, there's, it, it certainly creates such a level of mistrust between all those groups. Um, it's, it's a terrible thing. You know, we're all people We should be able to get along. You know, if you, if you look at it genetically, um, we're, we're so close to each other. Uh, you know, if, if we were dogs, we'd be the same breed of dog. Um, hmm. but you know, religion and all these other, um, ways that different people learn how to separate themselves from the others. It's terrible. Hmm. And, you know, religion just makes it that much worse. Mm. And no, you bring up a great point as far as the races and just considering that the different human races, uh, whether it be uh, Asian or uh, Caucasian or African, um, the races actually don't qualify to the point where we can start calling them subspecies because there are no real characteristics that are unique, genetic characteristics that are truly unique to any one uh, population of humans. So that is to say that we have people in Africa, some of them carry this gene that allows them to be resistant to malaria. It's a sickle cell gene. Okay. But we also have people in Indonesia. And really, the only similarity there is the type of environment. They're both exposed to malaria, hmm. and so they both carry that gene if they're in that particular area. And we have this similar phenomenon across, uh, occurring in humans all across the world. So there's no real genetic criteria to break up the races in a certain definable way, saying like, oh, well, only Africans have the malaria gene. That's not true. Any human living in an area where there's malaria will develop an increased frequency in the malaria-resistant genes. And of course. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's just how the human race has worked. And that's so that's why we consider everybody to be part of one race, one subspecies of humans, which is Homo sapiens sapiens. Because we're not different enough to be considered different subspecies. There are actually more variability, there is actually more variability within any particular race than there is between the races. Because it's actually the environment that dictates our genes. It's interesting. But yeah, we want to find ways to <laughs> make each other into other species, or at least feel like somebody that you dislike or are totally different from is another species of human almost. And uh, we do that with, a lot with color. Obviously, you got a long history of color being one of the main reasons for that. And region of the world, potentially. And then religions. Religions are a huge part of that. I think you're absolutely right, V. Like, religion is maybe the most extreme way that we do that. Possibly. Divide ourselves. Yeah. I mean, and it, it's the easiest one to, uh, to eliminate. You know, you can change your skin color, but... You know, you can accept that, you know, his, the other person's religion isn't a reason for you to dislike them. I mean, not that skin color is, but, um, you know, it's, mm. it, it's on the one end easy, you know, when you look at it from, from the free thinker, humanist perspective, but. From the religious perspective, it's very difficult because, you know, all the Abrahamic religions have these, uh, you know, uh, dogmas in there that, uh, you know, make you hate the other group. You know, oh, they're, they're the infidels or they're, uh, you know, they don't believe as me. This is blasphemy, you know. Um, all these reasons that you have to hate the others, even if they believe 90 some percent of what you believe you know well, a few misunderstandings are enough for protestants and catholics to just hate each other and to wage wars on each other 
Well, there seems to be a pretty large continuum on that. You have obviously the killing of people that you disagree with, but I, at least the, the church that I grew up in, we thought everybody else was wrong. Like we knew that some people had some things right, but we really reserved the title of authentic truth. And I don't know how across the board that is with religion, but I mean, most people choose a particular sect in a religion, a particular denomination and stick with that. Do they stick with it just because they're comfortable with it? Or do they, most people believe that they have, you know, the edge on truth. I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but I, from my experience and to the people that I've talked to, it seems like people believe they have the edge on truth, like that they are living their life more righteously than other people. Not that I, they, I think, I think it's definitely a mix of the two. Um, Definitely having some sort of community and belonging to something will contribute to that. But yeah, it's it's driven by the fact that, oh, oh, we think we are the best group of people. We think we have the facts. We think we are the way. So you should join us because then you'll be a member of the righteous, uh, awesome, high up people. Uh, and that's, that's a, a line of thinking that kind of pre- it was, at least, um, prevalent in this part of the state because we've actually had a number of grand wizards of uh, the KKK here in this part of the state. Um, and so when you start thinking about that, you're like, oh, well, that's that's great. We used to be a, a fortress for uh, some of these leading members of a bunch of white people that would use Christianity as a weapon against black people or gay people. Um and use it as some sort of platform to say, hey, unless you're white and straight, uh, you really don't even deserve to live. Uh, so we'll go out and lynch you, hang you, burn you, uh, whatever. And that's just to purify the rest of the world of all this non-white, non-straight kind of populace. I used to believe that stuff. For the yeah. ex-Christians, um, did you guys think that people of other Christian denominations could or will go to heaven? Uh, yes, I, I, well, I did, yes, but I didn't feel, um, I didn't feel like those other people could claim the promises of God the same way, or we were God's chosen people, or I'm, I'm making quote symbols up in the air that you guys uh, can't see right now. <laughs> I, I can hear those. I can you hear can hear them. the quotes? <laughs> no, I definitely thought I was superior, and I thought that gay people didn't deserve to live. I'm ashamed to think that I thought that. I didn't think that. I never would have gone out and killed anybody, oh, but my God. I cannot believe the stuff that I believed. And, you know, growing up, and we were kind of an extreme version of Christianity. I would call it a cult for sure. But we would be accused of being a cult and that we were brainwashed. And I could never understand brainwashed because I always thought brainwashed was some guy with a, you know, a, a pocket watch going back and forth. Or they would put you in a room and, you, oh, know, put, yeah. you know, not let you sleep like but that is not brainwashing. Brainwashing is just believing something or advocating the belief of something that has no evidence at all. And then making certain parts of so- social interaction dependent on whether or not they believe these things. And then also all the internal stuff that you do to somebody, going to hell or whatever. And then a million other small variations of that. I just... I... Uh, Kind of losing my train of thought here, but <laughs> well, it just we see don't it need anywhere. any more reasons to to be divided, you know, yeah. and yeah. to hate each other and to mistrust each other too, because you know it's it's not you know you don't have to hate the other people if you mistrust them, um, you know, over time that can build up into much more. Well, it's easy to be ashamed of, like, really bad brainwashing. Like, I thought gay people shouldn't be able to, shouldn't live because they were such a a down, a downer for society or whatever. But, I mean, it's easy to look in the mirror and think about yourself thinking that stuff and be absolutely ashamed of yourself. But there's a lot of things that are 
far more minute, but are the same type of thinking, uh, the same type of indoctrination or brainwashing that should be rooted out. And that is the cause of all of this, in my opinion, the cause of all of this terrorism stuff at its, at its root. But yet we, a lot of people who choose not to use evidence as their basis for fact are susceptible to that. They're totally susceptible to that. So in, in many ways, it's like if you're not using reason to determine what is true or not true or that you don't know, then you're all just kind of buying into the same kind of religion. It doesn't matter. It's all religion. It's all superstition. So not, not to be uh, offensive to V, because I, I think I've expressed previously how much I love V's voice. Uh <laughs> Uh, if I was if I was if I was homosexual myself, it, it would be a, a wonderful uh, love and appreciation for his voice. But he, here in America, growing up with the kind of upbringing I had, being where I was from, which is to say, this part of Indiana and in the United States, there was a certain degree of prejudice and bias towards people that sounded. Uh, like they were from Russia or from the Russian area. So they were communists. So they were evil yeah. because of the Cold War and because of all the stigma around that um, to make you kind of predisposed towards treating people who sound like that as the enemy or as somebody who's looking to destroy your American way of life. Yeah. But oh, but yeah. those views are, you know, kind of the 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 communist versus the you know, the Western democratic uh, kind of views were opposed almost as if they were two religions. You know, yes. they were so central to who you are or, or so we were told that, you know, a communist couldn't be a good person is what we were told yeah. on the yeah. side of the wall. Yep. And on the other side of the wall, you were told the exact opposite. And, and it's again, it, it's it's the exact same thing as, uh, you know, someone 500 years ago thinking that, uh, you know, Christians can be good or Muslims can be good or just because you're this or that, you know, or, uh, you know, when the Congregationalists and Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut were writing their letter to Jefferson where he responded back with the whole wall of separation between church and state, you know, different sects of Christianity were mistrusting one another here on, on U.S. soil and, and, you know, thinking that one of them was going to persecute and kill the other. Yeah. Um, so these kind of, you know, it, it all goes to these kind of dogmatic thinking where, you know, yeah. it's unchangeable, this is what it is, and, you know, this person in authority says this, so it is true, and um it's so so counterproductive it seems to me like toler you know tolerance is not the answer to solving our problems i'm not saying intolerance is or shit is acceptable but it's education education yeah. and the removal of ignorance in all possible ways that you can find is the way that we are going to come together and solve these problems um, it just seems kind of like a false argument, this idea of being tolerant of everything, because some things are just not. <laughs> well, well and worthy of tolerance. Should we, be, should we be tolerance? Should we be tolerant toward intolerance? No. You know? Yeah. Hmm. But that, you know, does that make us intolerant? You know, is that a bad thing? Yada, yada. Um, you know, it's it's tough. It's tough, yeah, but that's the beauty of being a skeptic. <laughs> yeah, at least for me, I don't trust myself with almost anything. I mean, there's well, there's some things that I believe, but I've given up the idea of belief being a part of who I am that's necessary. There's yeah. there's some things that I believe, but uh, it's hard for a lot of people who are steeped in dogma and superstition, whatever, to get comfortable with the idea that it's okay to not believe because you got there's belief requires a heck of a lot of evidence and there's not a lot of things in this world on the moral or religious or spiritual front whatever you want to call it that give enough evidence for a belief in something 
Yeah, and as a free thinker, you know, you recognize... That's my personal opinion, at least. You recognize how much or how little information you have to back up your beliefs. You know, if, if you have little information, it's easier to change your mind. If you have a lot of information, you know, you can still be skeptical, but, you know, it'll take a lot to overturn your opinion where... You know, with dogmatic thinking, you are not free to change your mind, even given new evidence. I mean, yeah. you were talking about gay people earlier. Um, I mean, I growing up, uh, you know, in Southeast Europe, I was listening to some, you know, rap hip hop bands and they were talking about how they wanted to beat up the gays and do all this and that and you know, I was I was singing right along with those tunes, and now I look back on it, I'm like, man, I I am so <laughs> glad. That, well, and, and it only took uh, knowing one gay person and finding out that they're gay after knowing them for a couple of years to realize that wait, this is all wrong. You know, I, I here's here's this person; they are normal. They didn't try to rape me. They didn't, you know, they were a good friend. Uh, they're good people. And, I mean, <laughs> I, did a, I did a 180 almost overnight after I found out that that specific person that I worked with was gay. I, and, I mean, yeah, there is, there is this, you know, when you reflect back on it, you think, okay, how could I have possibly taught this? Like, what drove me to it? And, you know, you didn't have much information. You heard this and that. Kind of sort of made sense. You know, it confirmed some inner bias, mistrust towards something you don't understand. And then that's okay. But, you know, when you get new information, being a free thinker allows you to change your mind. Yeah. It's a wonderful there's thing. actually... Yeah, yeah, there, there's a great movie I just watched. Uh, it was available on Hulu uh, since I have a Hulu subscription. And uh, it, it was this movie with Brendan Fraser, and he was a Jew going to college at some high prestigious college. I can't remember which one it was. Maybe it was Harvard or something. And uh, he was going to college, and he had to hide the fact that he was Jewish. Um, a, a fact that he was only able to hide for the first half of the movie until somebody found out, and then they're all of a sudden changing their viewpoints of him and treating him like crap. And you're like, what? Nothing changed. Like, this guy is still the star football athlete. He is still a stellar uh, straight-A student. No fact changed except for the fact that you learned that he was Jewish. Like, what's what's so different now? <laughs> um, and so He's it was Jewish, a great movie. Dude, that's all you need to know. It, 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 yeah, it was a great movie just pointing out how much prejudices play into your opinion of somebody, uh, even though they haven't changed <laughs> since you yeah. found out about that particular fact. Isn't that the truth? Well, from what I understand, there was some you know Catholic dogma that didn't get erased by the Pope um, until... Like sometime in the middle of this, of uh, you know, the 1900s, like 1950s, 60s, something like that, that blamed the Jews for the death of Christ. And, you know, so, you know, it sowed all this hatred mm. among Catholics towards Jews. And, you know, some people even, you know, credit to, I don't know what extent, you know, that, that viewpoint um, for, you know what happened in the Holocaust. Yeah. yeah. So no, all Jews hold the burden of crucifying Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they blamed them the Jews, and you know, since there was hatred, it allowed the the Holocaust. That's kind of the one of the you know theories out there. Um, you know, don't know how much credibility we can give to it, but yeah, yeah. I've definitely heard that cited a number of times as far as. Uh, people having that stigma uh, to blame somebody for the death of Christ, despite the fact, if you really look at it, it seems counterintuitive, right? Because wasn't it the death of Christ that cleansed all of your sins? 
So why yeah. why are you griping about it? Like I, I don't understand that logic because <laughs> normally it's Christians that are griping about it. So there's a lot of the logical things uh-huh. out there. That is all the time we have for you this week. This has been the Hoosier Humanist Hour. Be sure to check out Free Thought Fort Wayne on Facebook and Secular Fort Wayne on Meetup.com. Thank you for listening, and we hope your days are filled with logic, reasoning, and the eternal quest for knowledge.